Hey guys, Mike with you here again, and welcome to episode 6 of the Java VTM. In this video, we're going to be looking at strings and objects. Wow. Yes, this video is probably going to be a little bit more complicated than the last couple of videos, because objects and object-oriented programming is something that we really need to know to be able to program well in Java, but it's also something that's a little bit hard to get your head around if you're kind of new to this sort of thing. But not to worry, we'll get straight into it, and by first, we're going to be discussing objects, but and then we're just going to have a brief look at them, and then we're just going to focus on strings, because strings are a type of object in Java. And then we're just going to do some simple little things that demonstrate how we can use the Java API to find out how to do things with uh, objects and how we can manipulate strings. Okay? So we're not going to go into too much detail about object-oriented programming because I think that's something that's best taught by example. It makes a lot more sense if we're doing a building up a program from uh, objects rather than just me talking about them and then we just discuss a string, okay? So we're going to have a brief look and then we're going to sort of sit away, think about it for a while and come back to it later on. So anyway, let's get into it. What is an object. Well, if you think about it, an object can really be anything. It can be something from the real world, or it can be some con concept, or really it can be anything. We're going to stick, for this little brief outline, we're going to stick with a real world example. Okay, a car is an object, for example. My car is an object. It is a type of car. So, how do we map something like this in Java? Well, an object is described in a class, okay? A class really is a blueprint for an object. So every time we've gone public class, and we'll go car just for this example, what we're doing is really describing an object. Although all we've had in these classes so far has been the main method, which is a little bit different. A main method is a special one. But anyway, a class describes an object. That's what it is. So if... What does an object have? An object has different properties or attributes that describe it. For example, a car. What does a car got? Well, a car has a color. Yes, that is the correct spelling of color for you Americans. Not to worry. Um, by the way, I'm not following really nice Java syntax here. This is just a high-level example. So a car has a color. In my case, light blue. Um, what else have we got? A car has a license plate. Pretty much all cars have that. A car has an engine. Uh, what else do they have? We've got doors and we've got doors and things like that. But isn't that really part of the car? Um, what else is it? so we've got things like that. Okay. Attributes which describe the car. For example, if this was my car, if we were talking about my car object, light blue. Oh, it's terrible. It needs a paint job. It's getting a bit old. License plate would have my license plate in here. Engine would be, I don't know, it depends what we're going to do. Let's say these are all strings. 1.6 litre cor uh, 4AF engine. It's a Corolla engine, if you're wondering what the 4AF is. Yes, that's right, I drive a 1990 Corolla, not to worry. Um, <laughs> That doesn't matter, don't hold it against me. So these are properties which describe a car. Now a car also has, an object also has methods. For example, we might have a method that starts the car up. So public void start engine, something like that. This starts the car running, all of a sudden it's sitting in my driveway. What else have we got? Well, we might have a method to change the gears. And int gear would be the argument, which is the gear that we're going to change into, for example. So, with that, that pretty much all I want to say about objects in general. And now, for the rest of it, we're going to focus on strings. So, we've seen that an object has attributes or properties, and it has methods which can act on these attributes or do something for the object. Um, what else is it done? That's pretty much... All I want to say about objects for now, we're going to be dealing with objects a lot later because really, 
When we write Java programs, everything, every piece of code is part of an object, whether you notice it or not. So really, when we're writing complex programs, instead of just having a billion lines of code, what we do is we write a series of simple objects which interact together to get the job done. And we'll see that in practice uh, later on. It would make a lot, much, a lot more sense than me just sitting here and talking about it. So anyway, that's enough about my crappy car. Um, so what are we going to do in this video? For the rest of it, we're going to be looking at strings and how we can use strings. These, a lot of what we talk about is also going to apply to objects in general, but we're going to focus on strings, okay? So a bit of a comment, string test.java demonstrates using strings. Public class string test. and a main method. Okay, so what are we going to do? Let's declare a string variable. Okay, how do we do that? Well, declaration of any object is ex looks pretty similar to how we do it with primitive data types. We have the data type first, in this case it's going to be string, then the name of the variable, and we're going to call this string var. That's a declaration. What actually happens here is Java, just similar to how it does it with primitive data types, it allocates some memory for a reference to a string object. What do I mean by reference? Well, we'll see this in just a minute. Anyway, how do we initialize it with a variable? With a value, sorry. Strings are kind of special in Java. We've done, used strings all the time without even realizing it when we've done our print line statements. If we do something like this, using double quotes around a series of characters creates, this is what's called a string literal. Okay? It's actually a string object. So what we've done here is actually created a string object. Fairly simple. That's excellent. So that's awesome. We've got our string object. What can we do with that? Well, luckily for us, the Java API is really, really handy. So hopefully you guys downloaded all the Java API in the first video, like I said it would be a good idea to. If we come over to the Java API, and here it is, string class. Here's one I prepared earlier. We can see class string. The string class represents the character strings. All string literals in Java programs, such as ABC, note the double quotation marks, string literals, are implemented as instances of this class. What does that mean? Basically, it means that all of these string literals are objects of type string. They're string objects. Nothing too out of the ordinary there. So that's one way we can create a string. And to prove that it is actually a string, we can print this out. Okay, we'll save that, come over here and compile it. So it printed out fine. We do actually have something in this variable. So that's fantastic. How else can we create uh, a string object? Well, we, use, we do it using a constructor. And apart from strings, every object must be created, well, usually must be created using a constructor. And if we come down the Java doc a bit, we can see constru bleh, constructor summary. String with no parameters initializes a newly created object so it represents an empty character sequence. So how do we use this constructor? Let's create another variable. String string var2 equals, now we have the keyword new, new, then the name of the constructor. Constructor names are always the same name as the data type. So it'll be new string like this, and then parentheses, and inside the parentheses go our parameters to the method. If we have a look in our Java doc again, this one accepts no parameters, so there. What this has done is created a new string object with nothing in it, okay? Kind of simple, it's just an empty string. 
And we can still print this out, because we do have an object here. If we print out string var2, what happens? It prints out an empty line. Okay, we do have an object here, but there's nothing in it. If we do something tricky, like just... Bear with me. If we declare a string... Now, I've commented out the rest of this, which means the rest of this line is going to be a comment to Java, so it doesn't see it. String var2, we've declared it, but we haven't initialized it. What happens if we try and run this? We get a compiler error. This is what's handy about Java. The compiler co throws up a whole heap of errors. String var2 might not have been initialized. Well, it's quite right. So there you go. We can't do that. We have to at least have an object there. So anyway, how what, what else can we do? What else can we do? Well, let's have a look at a couple, another one of the constructors. This is a special one called, we call it the copy constructor. And here we go, this one here. It takes a string original as a parameter. And what this does is initializes a newly created string object so that it represents the same sequence of characters as the argument. In other words, the newly created string is a copy of the argument string. How can we use this? Well, it's pretty easy. If we want to make a copy of this string, we can put in here string var as a parameter. And now if we print out string var2, compile and run, we get Michael's Java VTM rocks again. So, that's the basic idea of how we create strings. And this, using the new keyword and the constructor, is how we usually create most of our objects in Java. There are a few exceptions which we'll deal with when we come to them. So, what else can we do? Well, what happens if we want to test if Java, if strings are equal to each other? And this comes up a lot. You might not realize it, but just say we're writing some program that is a net application. It passes HTTP or something. We're writing a web server even. Um, if you have a look at the HTTP protocol, you'll see that it's all text-based. In other words, to implement this in our programs, we have to convert strings to something that the program can use. So just to prove this, let's do a quick example. Let's connect to www.3dbuzz, actually, yeah, 3dbuzz will do, .com, on port 80. Port 80 is where the web server is listening. Now, we've connected to the 3dbuzz web server, and if we type get forward slash enter enter, we'll get something back, okay? Obviously, I had the syntax a bit wrong, so what's it given us? It's printed out something back. But you notice that this is all text that we can read. Okay, so text is used a lot. Strings are used all the time in programming. So it's a good idea so that we know exactly what's going on. So often we might want to see if these two strings are equal. And how can we do that? Well, using a primitive data type, you know, we'd go if uh, string var equals string var Two. Sister. Oh. They are equal. Now, what's going to happen here? It's not immediately obvious. String is string var equal to string var two. Let's just compile and find out. Where is it? There it is. It didn't print out that they're equal. Why not? We've used this copy constructor, so both, and we know from printing out string var2 that they are both contain exactly the same text. Why aren't they equal? Well, it's got to do with how Java handles objects in general. Okay, so if I jump over to Paint, in video two, when we looked at primitive data types, we saw that when we declared an int, for example, int var, this variable pointed to some location in memory which stored the value of our variable. Okay? That's how it works for all primitive data types, be it char, uh, boolean, long, double, that sort of thing. The variable points to the value. With objects, and strings are objects, it's a little bit different. If we have, 
in this case, string var. Actually, to save me writing, I'm going to call them string1 for string var and string var2 and, and str2. What happens here is our variable doesn't actually point to our string. No, no, no. It points to some other, something else. It points to... Basically, it stores a reference to the actual object or, some say, a memory address, which then points to our string object. Okay, so what happens when we actually when we use that copy constructor, we create a copy of the string, okay, but they they are not the same string object. So string two points to a reference, which might have. A different, which will have a different memory address. Okay, these are just arbitrary hex numbers that I'm thinking of. Okay, not real addresses. And then this reference points to the actual object. Okay, this is the fundamental difference, really, between how Java handles primitive data types and how it handles objects. Basically, we say that primitives like these are cool by value or pass by value in that when we use the variable name, we're actually getting the value of the variable. Whereas when we're dealing with objects like strings, they're called by reference. In other words, this is a reference that actually references this object. This points to that object, but it's not act the actual object stored in here. Okay? So that coming back to what I said before, when we declare a st string variable, or any object really, all this is doing is allocating some memory for the reference, not the actual object. It's a bit different. Okay? Just something to keep in mind. So, what happens here, these are only equal if they are the exact same object. Okay? In other words, if these references point to the same object, for example, if we uh, change this to white, hmm... I'm still learning how to use this Uber Paint. If we get rid of this, if these are point, if these have the same memory address in here, in other words, these are the same. They're pointing to the same object, okay? And that means it's okay. So if we just comment this out for a second, if we go string string var Two equals string var. Instead of using the copy constructor as we did in here, I'm an idiot. There we go. What's going to happen is that th the, this reference is going to be copied over into string var two. In other words, they point to the same object. So now, if we compile and run it, they are equal. Okay, because they are in fact the exact same object. They point to the same op the two variables store the same reference, so it works awesomely. So what else can we do? How then do we if we do we compare strings? Well, the main way that we do it, if we uh, just comment out this one now, we have a look in the Java API, which is here. We can see that we have a method called equals compares this string to the specified object and returns a boolean. In other words, we can go does string var dot equals and then parentheses and inside parentheses we have the other string that we're comparing. If string var equals string var2, print out they are equal. Now we know they're not the same object this time because we're using the copy constructor. But if we compile and run this they are equal. So equals is how we compare the actual objects, not the references. Okay? And if we have a look at what the Java API says, 
The result is true if the argument is not null and a string object represents the same sequence of characters as this object. In other words, if they store the same characters, they are equal. So that's what we can do, how we can compare strings. And really, most objects that you'll deal with, especially in the Java API, implements an, implement an equal method. String also has another one called equals ignore case, which works exactly the same way, but doesn't worry about the upper and lower case. In other words, it's not case sensitive. So if we did something like this, In other words, it's the same text, but it's not in, all in the same case. If we use equals ignore case here, compile, run, they are equal. Even though they're not exactly the same, equals ignore case makes is not case sensitive. So that's two ways that we can compare strings this, in a similar way to how we would do it if we were dealing with primitive data types. Okay, so what else can we do with strings? Well, if we look in the Java API, there's actually quite a number of different um, methods that we can use to act on strings. For, and what I'm gonna do is rather than, I'm not gonna go through all of them, because really you guys have the Java API, you can go through and have a look at some of these yourself. Because really the whole idea of this Java API is so that we can, when we need to do something, we can have a look and see what Java provides for us to be able to do that. As programmers, we don't have to remember every single thing in this Java API, because if you have a look at all the classes, there is quite a truckload of them. And that would just be impossible to remember. Also, we don't use them all very often. So if we, the idea is, instead of having to remember everything, what we do is we use the Java API to find out how we can do what it is we want to do. It's all about the solving of the problem, not really remembering every single thing that Java provides. But anyway, I am going to have a look at a few of them, a few of the more interesting ones, and then you can play with these if you like, uh, do whatever you want to do some string manipulation, and everything will be fantastic. The first thing I'm going to look at is substring. And there are actually two different substring methods that we are uh, fairly similar, but a bit different. Where is it? Substring. We've got substring, int begin index. So one that takes one parameter and one that takes two parameters, int beginning and end. Substring returns a new string that is a substring of this string. Hope that makes sense. It returns part of a string. This one skips some of the first bit, and this one can be any part of a string because it lets us supply the beginning and indent, end index of where we want this string to be. So, let's have a look at the first one first. Instead of printing out this, actually, we'll just comment out this for now because we know how that works. It all is awesome. Let's print out string var2. Dot, well, let's print out a substring of string var2. So what we do, we take the string na the name of the variable that we want to change. Okay, dot substring, the name of the method, and then parentheses. And what goes in these parentheses are the parameters. And we've had a look, this one takes a single int, okay? So let's just put in some number, five. Save that, and compile it, and run it. L's Java VTM rocks. Wow, good work, L. So, as you can see, substring skips the first five characters. It skipped one, two, three, four, five. So we printed out L's Java VTM rocks. That's what this particular substring does. It takes, it skips the first bit of the string and then prints out the rest of the string. That comes in really handy if we're trying to do some string manipulation or passing some protocol. Or here's an interesting one. If you were trying to upload, if you're trying to write some program that works on a 3D model, such as an OBJ file, if you export an OBJ file from Maya, you can write a Java program to read in these files. And actually, here's one I prepared earlier.
Oh, I can't type. GUI slash. Here's a file that I wrote that reads in an OBJ file. And it's really quite complicated. It's not, well, actually, it's not too complicated, but it's kind of big. But I'm just saying that it can be done. See, there's a lot of maths going on, pass doubles from getting parts of the string and things like that. So string manipulation is really important if we need to do particular jobs. And that's what substring does. It gives us part of a string. Now the other substring, hopefully now it's pretty obvious, if we specify an end index, such as 12, what do we get printed out? Elsja. Wow, that's excellent. Um, we've got 12, the end index is 12. What does that mean? Well, it's important to note that in computing in general, we usually start ca counting from zero. In other words, m is index zero, i is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay? So 12 gives us the V, and, but we only got printed out L's jar. It's, that's how to do, that's what substring works like. It goes up to 12, but not including 12, the end, ind end index, okay? Just something to keep in mind. And if we have a look at the Java doc for this, the substring begins at the specified begin index and extends to the character at index end index minus one. Thus, the actual character at end index, in this case 12, which was V, isn't printed out. Okay? So again, the Java API helps us to work out exactly what's going on with our method. Fantastic. So that's substring. Pretty kind of useful. What else have we got? Let's have a look. What can we look at? Uh, two lowercase or two uppercase. We'll do two upper. Converts all of the characters in this string to uppercase. Excellent. And returns a new string. So if we do system.out.println, again, we'll go string var, this is the string that we're manipulating, dot two upper case, parentheses. This method doesn't take any parameters, so we just leave it like that. So this is another thing to remember. This is what's handy about Notepad++. It highlights where our parentheses and brackets line up. So you can see that this ending one belongs to this starting one, and this ending one belongs to this starting one. It's important that we cover all of them. We don't want any loose ones, otherwise we'll get compiler errors. So let's just quickly save this, compile it, clear the screen, and run it. We've got it all in caps lock, and now Java's yelling at us. So two upper just changes everything to uppercase really handy at times. What else have we got? What else have we got? Um, trim. If you have a look in a keyboard class that I have supplied, trim is really handy. Uh, what it does, if we look in the Java API, returns a copy of the string with all leading and trailing white space omitted. That's really important because uh, when we're getting things from the keyboard and we wanted an int, for example, it was important that we didn't let the user go and press enter. Oh, don't worry about that. Okay, so what I use trim when I read in data from the keyboard into the keyboard class so that we could uh, not have to worry about this all this white space that the user might have provided if they were trying to annoy us. So trim is another really handy one, which uh, I'm not going to do any testing with now because I've said what it does in here. And you can have a look at the keyboard class and see what happens if you comment that line out. Um, what else have we got? What else have we got? Value of blah, blah, blah. Starts with... Test if the string starts with the specified index. It returns a Boolean, which means we can use it in our Boolean expressions like ifs. Or loops. We've talked about loops, which is cool. So if we change this, if stringvar dot 
starts with Michael print out it does all right oh where is it there it is it goes all right I spelt it wrong so we can see that Michael's Java VTM really does start with Michael's with Michael. If we put something else in here, this will obviously return false because we know that the people who wrote the string class are pretty smart. It's not likely that they've got bugs in that method. Okay? And it does, it does exactly what we're expecting. So with that, that is gonna wrap up this video. Hopefully it hasn't been too much uh too confusing for you, although we talked about objects, and objects are a little bit of a complex thing to get your head around if you're new to them. But anyway, we've looked at objects, and we've looked at how Java uses strings, we've looked at the Java API for them, how we can create strings, how we can uh, manipulate these strings, we've looked, most importantly I think, at how the call by value versus call by reference and how we can't just go string equals like that. We have to use the dot equals method. And that's true with all objects. All objects use this reference idea instead of just holding the object here. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, it's re And really, this will just become second nature when we start doing something a bit more complicated. So with that, it's going to wrap up this video. So thanks a lot.